Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the auditorium, Calvary Road Baptist Church in uh, the People's Republic of California, the gulag known as Los Angeles County, the city known as Monrovia. Nice to have you here on this beautiful day today. Um, delighted for all of us to be here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for your goodness. We appreciate so much the opportunity that we have to meet together to encourage one another. Uh, it's so um, beneficial being part of a church family, knowing that we are together for exhortation and encouragement. So much the more, more as we see the day approaching. We're thankful for the opportunity to minister to uh, the Hardy family, Kelly's mom passing, and the Regali family with the CR's dad passing. Pray that you might help us, Lord, to uh, keep them in prayer, to be an encouragement to them. We pray also for uh, Jackie and Socorro. We pray for Ruby and Olga. Olga's ongoing uh, physical health struggle in uh, Nebraska. We pray for Chuck and for Dan and Donna in uh, in Oregon, for Linda Fay in Arkansas, excuse me, in Missouri, for uh, Pastor Joe in Northern California, for other sick loved ones here at the church. We pray also for our Through the Bible reading program, uh, our discipleship ministry, and of course, in these last days, we pray for not only the urgent need of, but the opportunity to participate in evangelistic outreach. We ask that you would bless our church, help us to be a blessing to others, and for that we thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like for you to turn in your Bible, if you would please, to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. We are in that portion of the gospel accounts that addresses the taking of the Lord Jesus Christ from the judgment hall and the presence of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, um, along the Via Della Rosa to the cross at Golgotha. In Matthew chapter 27, beginning with verse 31, we read, And after they had mocked him, this would be Roman soldiers, they took the robe off from him, and put his own raiment on him, and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. Now turn, please, to Mark chapter 15, where I begin reading with verse 20. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him unto the place of Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. Now turn, please, to Luke chapter 23 and verse 26. And as they, again the Roman soldiers, led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country. That's twice we read that he was coming out of the country. And laid, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves 
and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. John chapter 19, beginning with verse 16. <coughs> Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. So to refresh your memory, because it's been some time, since we have dealt with our Lord's experiences in the 12 hours leading up to these four passages before us, I'd like for you to recount with me the events as they unfolded. Recall that the Lord Jesus Christ gathered uh, with his 12 apostles in the upper room and while there, he, very surprisingly to them, washed their feet, then surprising to them, predicted that one of them would betray him and ate the Passover meal with them in the upper room before instituting the communion of the Lord's Supper. At one point, if you recall, Judas Iscariot was dismissed from the upper room at which time he completed the arrangements for his betrayal of the Lord for 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. Leaving the upper room with the remaining 11 apostles, the discourse and prayer of John chapters 14 through 17 took place as they passed by the temple on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the Lord prayed while the eleven slept. Remember, he woke them up several times, and they nodded off and went back to sleep. Judas Iscariot then led several delegates dispatched by the chief priests, along with perhaps a dozen or two temple guards and some five to six hundred Roman soldiers to take the Savior into custody. That's typically a surprise to most people because the, the significance of the numbers of the Romans does not appear in the English translation of the Bible because the Greek word uh, refers to a cohort. A cohort is, if I recall correctly, one-sixth of a legion, and a fully manned cohort would be a thousand men typically cohorts. The military is typically understaffed when they're not involved in actual war, and a Roman cohort typically numbered 500. So we would guess that there were two or three civilians. There, of course, was the betrayer. Then there was a dozen or two temple guards, and then there were 500 Roman soldiers. That would include a couple of centurions, that would certainly include a tribune uh, to be in charge of everything. Um, first taken to the home of the former high priest, Annas, and that's where the Lord Jesus Christ was subjected to his first trial. The Lord was then taken to the home of the current high priest, Caiaphas, the son-in-law of Annas, and there he was subjected to the second illegal trial in the middle of the night. And they then waited there for the breaking of, of the day. 
at which time the third and final trial before the Jewish Sanhedrin took place. That is, the final of the religious trials took place. The Lord was then taken to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. We don't know with precision where he was taken, but it's likely that he was taken to uh, the Praetorium, uh, possibly in, in the Antonia Fortress, for his first trial before the Roman governor, then to Herod Antipas, because the Lord was a Galilean, and therefore subject to the jurisdiction of Herod Antipas, he was taken there. This was the guy, if you recall, who had murdered his cousin, John the Baptist, three years earlier, uh, when he berated Herod for marrying um, his wife's, um, for marrying a, a woman who was married to another guy. And then he was after that, uh, and Herod, all he wanted him to do was to work some miracles, uh, but he didn't. And so he was then taken back to Pilate for the final trial and for the sentencing to death by crucifixion. And it was during this time, probably during this last time he was in or around Pilate, that the Savior was mercilessly beaten, scourged with Roman cat o' nine tails, and, and also ridiculed by the Roman soldiers, who of course, because they were excellent at this, taunted him with their cruel game of king for a day. Uh, and in doing that, they draped a robe over his shoulders, placing a crown of thorns on his head while feigning worship. Uh, don't forget they also put a, a reed in his hand uh, to mockingly uh, represent a, a rod of authority, a scepter. So when, adapt, when, when, when studying these and considering these four passages which we've just read, I'm going to remain, which is a little different than the way I usually do it, I'm going to remain in each gospel account throughout, verse by verse fashion. And my purpose in doing this will be to avoid mixing the thrust of each gospel. Each gospel account was written primarily to a different audience, okay? Uh, it's very clear from the references to the fulfillment of Old Testament passages and to the references that it was written or it has been written that Matthew's gospel was written primarily to a Jewish audience who were very familiar with the Old Testament, would be keenly aware of and interested in the fulfillment of Old Testament passages, Old Testament predictions. Then, of course, Mark was written, um, and of course, Matthew has the Lord's genealogy. Mark uh, portrayed the Lord Jesus Christ as the perfect servant. He was written to a, Mark's gospel was written to a Roman world. Okay, what do the Romans not care about? They don't care about the genealogy of any slave. They don't care who his mom was. They don't care who his dad was. They don't care what he, where he came from. All they're interested in is what can he do for me right now? Can he take care of business? Can he do what I want? That's the reason why in the gospel according to Mark, you see so many times the word straightway, 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 because it shows the Lord Jesus Christ as the perfect servant of God, immediately, straightway, forthwith, taking care of God's business. Then, of course, there was the gospel according to Luke. It was written for a, a much more broadly Gentile audience than was, than was Mark's gospel. Obviously, Romans are, are Gentiles, but Luke wrote for Gentiles, perhaps, who were not Romans, as well as for Romans. Uh, being a physician, there are details in his gospel that appear to no, appear nowhere else. Um, he has a much more intimate and personal look at uh, the experiences of the Lord Jesus Christ, not only at this point, but in all of the experiences leading up to it. And then there's the gospel according to John. The gospel according to John is the most complex of the four gospel accounts. 
Um, if I were a brand new Christian, or if I were ministering to a brand new Christian, I probably would not uh, suggest that they read the gospel according to John first off. And the reason is, is because it's a complicated gospel. And there's, there's, there's levels and shades of meaning all through the gospel. Uh, and keep in mind that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were probably written in the 60s, some 30 years, 25 to 35 years after the Savior's resurrection and ascension to heaven. But the gospel according to Matthew was written a full 65 years later. It was the last of the four gospels written. And, and therefore, it was the least necessary for the advance of the gospel. Because by the time the gospel according to John had been written, the gospel had probably already reached almost the British Isles in the west and almost the east coast of India in the east. Now, it's good. It's necessary. It's beneficial. It's very edifying for, for, for Christians. But it's not nearly as necessary uh, simply by keeping track of when it was introduced to the world it's not as, as significantly necessary to evangelizing the lost as were Matthew and Mark and Luke. So let's go now to Matthew chapter 27. Let's begin this evening with Matthew chapter 27 and verse 31. Let's read through verse 34, and then we'll look, we'll focus a little bit more on verse 31, and then I will attempt to salvage something of my voice. I'm getting really tired at the pace with which my vocal cords are responding, so I'll beg your indulgence this evening. Beginning with verse 31, we read Matthew 27, verses 31 through 34 again. And after they had mocked him, these are the Roman soldiers, they took the robe off from him, him being the Lord, and put his own raiment on him. In other words, they... They took the clothes they gave him away from him. Well, they needed to use them for the next guys they were crucifying. And they put his own clothes back on him and led him away to crucify him. Verse 32, and as they came out, probably coming out of um, the, um, the Antonia Fortress, my guess, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Now, Cyrene is in North Africa. So this is a guy who had come all the way from North Africa, probably for the High Holy Days and the celebration of Passover. Him they compelled to bear his cross. Almost every movie that I have ever seen depicting the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ gets this so badly wrong so terribly, terribly wrong. And Lord willing, next week, I'll, I'll show you why. Verse 33, And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, which is to say a place of a skull. Um, Sophia's next door. My daughter's next door. Stephen is not here. Uh, I sure wish you guys had gone to Israel with me because... There is a place where if you stand there and you look up at this hillside, you see two eye sockets, you see what used to be the hole in the skull for a nose, and you see what looks to be a mouth. It's, part, it's, it's, it's a shallow cave, and it's just up to the right over what's called Gordon's tomb. Uh, I, it, Gordon's tomb is probably not the place where the Lord Jesus Christ was entombed, his body was entombed. But boy, is it sure a nice place to go. I'm just telling you. Uh, you, 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 just, you feel like you're stepping back into the first century by going there. If you go to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, which is a nasty place, uh, it's presided over by the Armenian Apostolic, the Greek Orthodox, and the Roman Catholic Churches. And it was built probably 1,500 years ago. They all claim rightful ownership of it. And since it's owned by the group and not by any individual group, they went like for a 1,000 years without ever maintaining it. 
and it's just nasty inside, okay? Imagine uh, a 1,500 years of accumulated soot from burning candles. Then the modern state of Israel deemed it to be such a hazard to people, to tourists, that they said, you either, you either fix it, make it safe, or we're going to take it away from you and do it ourselves. Well, the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church and the Armenian Apostolic Church, uh, reprobate as they are, they did not want uh, the modern state of Israel taking over control of their most hallowed and holy site. And so they fixed it up, kind of. Uh, they cleaned it up, kind of, you know. So... So let's recall some things as we look at verse 31 again. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. Recall from Matthew chapter 27, verses 28 and 29, that the Savior had been mocked by the Roman soldiers, putting a robe on him, putting a crown of thorns on his head, putting a reed in his hand as a scepter of authority, all this in mocking fashion, okay? And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. You would not want to be one of these guys at the great white throne judgment because it's going to be, it's going to be thrown up in their faces what they did to the Lord of glory shortly before crucifying him, unless, unless some of them came to Christ. And it was back in verse 26 that we informed that he had been scourged. Now, the problem, if you go back to Matthew chapter 27 and, and or Matthew 27, verse 26, the brevity of the comment, okay, belies the severity of the torture the Lord Jesus Christ was, was subjected to. All it says was he was scourged. But that one word, uh, there, there are books written about that one word, okay? Uh, if I wanted to freak you out, if I wanted to assault you with gore, there are pictures on the internet that show what a typical person looks like after he has been thoroughly scourged by a Roman soldier. And quite literally from behind, you can see all of his ribs, and sometimes you can see his spine. Uh, it was really, really, really bad, okay? But I'm not going to go farther than the Bible seems to be willing to go on this, and so I'll just let you know that the torture the Lord Jesus Christ was subjected to was mind-boggling incomprehensible to anyone in this room. I promise you, you have no idea, and neither do I. Even after seeing the pictures, we still have no idea what it was like to be subjected to that. And then they mocked him, hail king of the Jews. So there can be no doubt about the physical condition the Lord Jesus Christ was subjected to Lord Jesus Christ was probably in the neighborhood of five foot six, five foot seven. He probably was a pretty lean 145 pounds, okay? He was probably a very fit, very, um, very in shape physically. Because remember, for, th for 33 and a half years, he worked and walked, okay? So his body was lean, his body was hard, uh, he was fit. Uh, but there can be no, no doubt about his physical condition. Severe lacerations all over his back, all over his shoulders, all over his buttocks. The backs of his legs, the backs of his arms were shredded, okay? And he suffered incredible damage to his body. Even if he had not been crucified, it is almost guaranteed he would have died within a day or two, okay? He would have died because of the severe hydration that he suffered as a result of the loss of blood. 
as a result of, um, what, what do they call it? Uh, I'm going to ask Ozzy. Uh, exsanguination. Exsanguination. That's the loss of blood. Uh, he, lost, he lost a tremendous amount of blood uh, during that ordeal before he was ever crucified. That he was able to continue standing was a testimony to his vigor, a testimony to his youth. He's 33 and a half years old. So he's in the physical prime of his life, okay? And his determination to go through with his sacrifice for sins to please his father. So now, done with their ridicule, these professional death merchants, because that's what Roman soldiers were. They were professional death merchants. They now get down to their real business, They'd had fun, okay, they'd taunted, they'd tortured, but their real business is not torture, their real business is not taunting, their real business is killing, okay? <clears throat> so they begin by taking off the fake royal attire that they had placed on him and replacing his garments simple as they were, and then they led him to the place of crucifixion. Right now, if I could have uh, Bill on this side and uh, Rick on this side. If you could have one of these, hand one of these out to each person. Appreciate that. They're, hand, they're handing you out a map that I am not in full agreement with. What did he just say? You are about to hold in your hands a map that I do not fully agree with. I'm not attempting to deceive you. I'm not attempting to trick you. I'm being open and honest. I do not fully agree with this. Okay? You say, well, why are you giving it to us? Because I'm not a graphic artist. I didn't have time to reach out to Nick <laughs> and have him do for me what he's done for me in the past. There just wasn't enough time. This is the best map that I could come up with, and it shows the stations of what is called the Via Dolorosa. Okay? This is a plan of a portion of Jerusalem. It shows the route that our Lord Jesus Christ was taken on from Pilate's judgment hall to the place where he was crucified. I'm not in full agreement with this, okay? But it gives you a good idea. Uh, via Dolorosa, those two words are Latin for the painful way or the sorrowful way. Dolorosa refers to pain and sorrow, via is the Latin word for, uh, for, for way, or root, or pathway, something like that. So my disagreement with the map that you hold in your hands is basically in regard to two things. First, notice location number 14 on your map. And if anybody watching this on YouTube later would like a copy of the map, email me and I'll be glad to send you a copy. But notice, location number 14 on your map is where the Church of the Holy Sepulcher is, is located in Jerusalem. That's that nasty piece of architecture I told you about, okay? Which I am not convinced. Let me make it more strongly. I am convinced the Savior was not entombed there following His crucifixion when it was taken down from the cross. You say, well, why do you, why do you believe that? Well, because the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is located in Jerusalem city proper and is inside the wall that surrounded Jerusalem in that day. And our Lord was buried, according to the Bible, our Lord was buried outside the wall, okay? Which would be to the upper left of the map as you're looking at it. So that's reason number one. I don't think he was crucified near there. 
and I don't think he was buried near there. So my second objection is I'm persuaded the Lord was crucified outside the wall as well. So he was taken outside the wall to be crucified, and his body was taken down from the cross, verified that he was dead, and his body was entombed outside the wall. Okay, You say, well, what causes you to believe that, Pastor? How could people be wrong for uh, 2,000 years? There's a lot of people been wrong about things for a lot longer than that, okay? I believe the Bible is right, and I believe archaeologists are frequently wrong. Hebrews chapter 13, if you would turn there. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 10 through 13. I could show you a lot of passages in the Old Testament, but this one in the New Testament should suffice. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 10 through 13, is the basis for my conviction that the Lord Jesus Christ was neither crucified inside the walls, and they know exactly where the walls were. He was neither crucified inside the walls, neither was he his body entombed inside the wall. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 13. We have an altar. Now look up, please. I'm a Baptist pastor. I've been a Baptist pastor for 45 years. I get sick to death of Baptist preachers trying to encourage people to come forward to an old-fashioned altar. How can you do that? How can a preacher invite someone to an old-fashioned altar when Hebrews chapter 13, verse 10 says, we have an altar. We have an altar. Who is the altar? What is the altar? The altar is the Lord Jesus Christ, not steps at the front of an auditorium, not a banister or a railing at the front of a, 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 the front of a room. I just get so sick to death. We're supposed to be biblically literate people, okay? We have an altar. We don't have altars. We have an altar. We have one altar, and it's not here. It's not here. It's not anywhere down here. <laughs> Our altar is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven on high, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. So enough with this nonsense. I believe preachers ought to be called on this. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. In other words, we have an altar, the Lord Jesus Christ, those who serve the tabernacle, in other words, those whose ministry is guided by the law of Moses have no right. They have no claim to the altar that we have. Okay? Verse 11, for the bodies of those beasts, in other words, those animals that were offered up in sacrifice, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned without the camp. Okay, those bodies are taken outside the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, those were Old Testament types of which the Lord Jesus Christ is the fulfillment. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. In other words, and his suffering took place how? On the cross, outside the gate, which is to say outside the wall. So he was not crucified inside Jerusalem. Verse 13, let us therefore, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp. Let's go to where he is. Let's get out of here. Okay? Outside the restrictions and the boundaries of the law of Moses. Okay? Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. In other words, part and parcel of the Christian life is you take a measure of what he took. Stay home for an hour. It better take more than an hour to stay home, to keep you home. Stay home because you got a headache. It should take more than a headache to keep you home. Our responsibility as God's people, as God's children, as believers in Jesus Christ 
is for us to bear his reproach. In other words, our job as Christians is to be ready and to be willing to suffer. Not just physical suffering, but suffering for persecution. Okay? And, and the imagery of that is outside the camp, outside the wall, beyond the restrictions of the law of Moses. Why? Because when the Lord Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross, he satisfied all of the demands of the law. And the law doesn't save anybody. Amen? So, with these exceptions noted, the map that I gave you will serve to give you some idea of the route taken when the Lord carried his cross to the place of crucifixion. And the next time I go to Jerusalem, I'll let you know if you want to go with me. You can. Uh, I probably am not going to put together a tour. I'll let you pay full price. Because <laughs> um, I'm going to pay full price. Um, but I would be glad to take you where I'm going. I'm, my plan is to rent a car, drive through the whole country, okay? Maybe maybe another couple with Pam and, 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 and me. Maybe Sarah, who knows? Uh, but to drive the country, land at Laud uh, Airport um, outside of uh, Tel Aviv, drive north um, up to Haifa, one of the most beautiful cities in the entire world, spend some time in Haifa, uh, go over to um, the Golan Heights, uh, which Syria claims, but which, which Israel has, look down on uh, Galilee, uh, drive in and around the Sea of Galilee, spend time in Capernaum and, and Chorazin and Bethsaida and, and, and Magdala, where Mary Magdalene came from, Go look at the fishing boat that they got up off the bottom of the, of the Sea of Galilee uh, that sank sometime in the first century. Uh, learn all about that stuff. Stand on Mount Arbel and look down over the entire, the entire region of, of Galilee from Tiberias down here uh, to Mount Hermon up there um, and uh, Mount... Um, I slipped my tongue. Where, where did where did uh, where did Elijah uh, kill the four hundred fifty prophets of Baal? Mount Carmel, yeah, Mount Carmel, um, and you can see you can see you can see all of that in one look from one position. You can see it all, and then from there we'll drive down to uh, Jerusalem, spend a couple of days in Jerusalem, go down to Masada, maybe go to En Gedi, uh, go out into the Judean wilderness. Uh, it'll be the time of your life. We'll we'll have to stop at um, uh, at the Shrine of the Book, which is Israel's most significant. And we'll, we'll look at museums all along the way because I'm a museum freak. But the, the Shrine of the Book, the top of it looks like the top of a piece of pottery that they found in the Qumran Caves, wherein they found all of these copies of old manuscripts that had been put there and were lost for 2,000 years. And so the, the, the roof of, the, of this museum looks exactly like that piece of pottery that's about this big around and sticks up about this high. You grab it, you take it off, reach down in, pull out documents. And the, and the museum was built around the Isaiah scroll. The Isaiah scroll that they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls was uh, carbon dated to before the time of Christ. It was found in 1947. They carefully took them a couple of years to, un, to unfurl it, to unwind it so that it wouldn't crumble. And they discovered that the Isaiah scroll hidden away for more than 2,000 years is exactly, exactly the Hebrew book of Isaiah that we have today. In other words, the word of God in 2,000 years has not been altered. It hasn't been messed with. It hasn't been harmed. It hasn't been damaged. It hasn't been cha changed in any way. And uh, we'll have an opportunity. We'll have an opportunity to look that. That is, if you go with me, and and who knows, uh, we may even get there for a war. Because uh, of the times that I've been there, three times was just before the outbreak of a war. So I, I think I cause wars. Uh, Gulf War One, a Gulf War Two, and the encroachment when Israel, when the IDF went into Gaza the last time, not the current time, 
the last time they went before the October 7th uh, massacre of, of the Jewish people living nearby. And so um, um, it will make the word of God um, it will hit you with a significance of Bible passages that you have never, bore, never before experienced. Uh, it, it, is, it is something that I think every Christian who can possibly afford it needs to go. And I mean need to. I mean needs to go at least one time in your life. Don't do one of these six-day, seven-day, nine-day things where you get off a bus and they're running like this and you're going crazy and you get back in the bus and you haven't really seen anything. A minimum amount of time your first time needs to be 15 days. It needs to be 15 days. That'll give you 12 days in country, okay, where you spend, you spend four days in the north, four days in the central, four days in the south, and the next time you go, you'll have in your mind picked out all of the spots that if you ever go again, you're going to want to spend two or three days at that one place, okay? Um, so, so much for the commercial. I'm not planning. I, I, have, I have no plans. I'm just telling you. Um, if, if I have to, if, well, no. no. <laughs> I'm going to try to figure out a way to go again someday, someday before I die. Because I love looking at the terrain ground level, and I want one more look before I see it from the sky at the second coming of Christ so I can compare what it's like, okay? Let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you for your goodness. I pray that you might help us, especially as we are approaching Easter time in a week and a half that we might be particularly mindful of these portions of Scripture which deal with our, our Lord's passion leading to His crucifixion. Of course, we know and can historically prove that not only did He die on the cross of Calvary, but that He rose again. Historically, we can prove that He rose from the dead. And we are so excited about studying the Bible and, and learning about the sacrifice of our Savior on our behalf, I pray that you might help us to be eager to look for ways to experience Bible truth that are available to us. Help us to make use of the various kinds of means, particularly if it was so important that believers used to, used to list, literally go on pilgrimages that would take months, a thousand years ago, and it's so very, very easy for us to do that today. I pray that you might bring peace to the region so that we might someday be able to go again before the Lord Jesus Christ comes. Bless this to our Christian lives, living for you, loving you, and serving you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm wondering if you have a question.